So, hey, I'm so delighted to be here with Joseph, who's the CEO of Milo. Is the U.S. housing market going to crash? That is the question. Joseph, welcome. Yeah, thank you for, for having me here. Um, well, you know, it depends on who you ask. Um, you know, we've been very comfortable with uh, home prices going up for the last three years. And uh, it looks like uh, prices are still going up, but it's a function of not a lot of inventory that's out there. Um, but we have started to see certain markets uh, that are stagnating. There's not a lot of transactions that are happening. And when some people do need to sell their homes, they are having to sell them for a discount, a 10 to 20% discount, which should impact uh, the overall market. Um, so I don't think we'll have a crash per se, but I think that it's the time to start looking for, for opportunities. Where do you want to buy? And uh, hopefully you can pick up something at an attractive level that, uh, that couldn't have been done you know, maybe 12 months ago, but today it, 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 we're getting into that zone. So that's fantastic news. Joseph does not believe we're going to have a crash, more a correction. And I kind of tend to agree coming from the UK. I think we're going to have an adjustment. You can't expect property prices to go up for so long without sort of some sort of adjustment. Yeah. There's many homes that have gone up over 100% in the last three years here. That's not a norm wow. normal increase. 100% up. 100%. Some even you know, 150%. So, and wow. many people that bought homes in the beginning of last year are trying to sell them for double this year already. Uh, those are the homes that are not selling. You know, quite frankly, people can see the data. No one's excited about paying double year over year. Um, so we are starting to see some of that. I think the other thing that is going to start to happen is many of these homes that are higher value, that are close to the ocean, that are beachfront property, um, you know, the desirable places where a lot of our international clients buy, um, those were bought with adjustable rate mortgages. So there's this thinking that most mortgages in the US are 30 years. That is true, while about seven to 10% of all mortgages that get originated or less have been originated the last three years are adjustable rate mortgages. So those are generally originated for individuals that are getting loans from banks or people that are getting loans through their private banks when they're more affluent. Those loans were generally free one arms, which means the rate is fixed for the first three years. And then after that, it starts to float. So for many individuals who bought homes two years ago, where they got a 3% mortgage, that will reset to a six, a seven, or an eight. So you could see someone that maybe got a mortgage, they were paying $10,000 a month, the taxes are higher because the home value is higher, the insurance has gone up because we've had more natural disasters, but now their mortgage rate is going to increase as well. So that person who may have had a property paying a monthly expense of maybe 10 to $12,000, that might balloon to 25 or $30,000 which will mean we believe that will impact some people and require them to sell or at least look at selling, creating more activity in the market. Wow. I mean, that's a massive adjustment to take. So you've got insurance premiums and other associated costs plus higher interest rates. Although from what I'm reading in, in the financial papers, rates are starting to come back a little. Yeah. Are you starting to see that in the pricing of mortgage products? I think in the past week, um, so where we are, so beginning of November, um, they have backed up a little bit. I think the common consensus though is that most mortgages tend to be tied to the 10 year US treasury bond. Um, that has so uh, sold off a little bit uh, going into the last month, um, which means now rates are actually coming coming down. So, so to educate me, I mean, you know, base rate in the United Kingdom is 5.25%. Yep. Yep. What's that 10 year rate looking like? So right American? now, if you're getting a conventional loan, you know, government subsidized, US government purchasing that bond, Fannie, Freddie loan, uh, you're somewhere between the seven and a half to 8%. So the, the magic number was 8%. Once we eclipsed that, basically activity completely stopped. We had that when it went from six to seven, there was this period of recalibration. We went from seven to eight, things stopped. Now it's pulled back in seven and a half. There's been a little bit more activity this week, um, but we'll see how that, how that shapes out. I think the things that I'm talking about with taxes and insurance, those are more structural in nature. Now that won't be the case for the whole US, but it will be in markets like South Florida, Miami, and some of these uh, places where the home values are higher. And given that they're more uh, valuable homes, it tends to basically lead towards more international clients, more affluent clients. Uh, that will feel it. They don't have to sell, but they're going to have to definitely pay more for the same home they would have basically paid for over the last couple of years. That's incredible to uh, hear you educate us on what's happening and what, what you're thinking. Where do you think rates will go? Because again, in the United Kingdom in the last week, they're now saying that we're expecting 
some sort of base rate cuts June, July next year, maybe a quarter percent. The traders are trading yep. cuts as much as three quarters of a percent. Yep. Do you think that's going to happen? How do you yeah. see the next yeah. one, two, three years out? If we look at the next 12 months, what, yeah. what do you expect? Yeah, I think what we're going to see is a normalization of the rate curve. So what that means is that generally, if you're going to lock up your money for one month or three months, you're going to expect some rate of return. If you're going to lock up your money and basically buy a bond that's longer term, five years, 10 years, 30 years out, you're going to expect to earn more. Well, what's happened is that our yield curve has been higher to put money out at one month or two months than it was to lock up and put money out for 30 years. That's not a normal market. What we're starting to see is a normalization of the rate curve. And what that means is that the short-term rates, if we do get a recession, which I think a lot of people are forecasting that next year we may get into that uh, more of recalibration of the economy, it's very possible that the short end of the rates will come down. The challenge is that the longer term rates, the 10 year and the 30 year should stay elevated because of all of the debt that we need to issue. And there's no natural buyer of so many US bonds that are out there. So I think that mortgage rates will tend to stay higher for longer in spite of possibly the Fed um, lowering short term rates because of all of this issuance that needs to happen with basically funding and right now the US deficit. Um, so I do expect rates to stay high. I don't think we're going to see a 3% mortgage rate in the US anytime soon. Um, but I do, I could see us going back from that eight to a seven, maybe in the sixes, maybe five, but definitely not. And what sort of time frame? So we're sort of eight to seven to six to five. I mean, five, <laughs> when we're at eight, we're going to be thinking, wow, I'll take yeah. five all day long. Yeah. Is that two years or three years? I mean, things change yeah. quickly. Yeah. What yep. do you think when I mean, the I, guy... I, I think we probably have something next year where we're probably sort of in that sixes is probably where we would probably be. Okay. I think if you get some type of um, geopolitical event or something that is outside, then you could see the flight to quality and then you could see some of the uh, longer term bonds come in um, on the back of people starting to stretch for yield, right? We, as a, as a, I would say as, as a globe, right? From doesn't matter where you were in the world, you know, most people were earning very little on their cash. Now people have been earning something on their cash right. for the last 12 months. That starts to feel pretty good if you actually right. have some wealth. Yeah. Um, I believe that's going to be very hard for people to get away from knowing that their money is working for them, which means they will start to stretch if the short term, you know, Fed curve, which is roughly around in the fives right now, if that starts to come in to a four to a three that I think people will start to add a little bit of duration to their portfolio to continue to make some income for a longer period. And that could pull rates lower on the longer end of the curve. I think the balance is, is that when retired people or more mature people of age have got investments and savings and they're now getting a return, they're probably spending. So you've got the count. We've, we've never had higher interest rates probably for at least 10 years. Yeah, that's been a long time. More than 10, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, mortgage rates are at, a high, at the highest level here in the US in the past 20 years. So, yeah. so we're at definitely at that elevate, right? We went from a all-time low on rates to now a 20-year high. And if you look at affordability for US individuals, it's the lowest it's been almost historically um, because there's this massive imbalance. Um, but if you are a saver and you have assets, you're feeling pretty good right now because you are now making income right. on your money, yeah. which uh, 12 months ago, you were having to take on greater risk, like investing in the stock market, investing in uh, other asset classes, which perhaps you weren't properly risk adjusted. You weren't getting paid enough for the risk that you were taking. And sure. now um, a lot of people can do nothing and, and really not take a lot of risk and earn somewhat of an attractive return. So I believe people are going to want that into the future, right? Historically, um, people have kept a portion in real estate, a portion in equities, a portion in bonds. Um, bonds prior to the last 12 months was almost a bad word. Correct. And, and now all of a sudden it's become something that people are, are, are drawn to. Uh, this idea of making money on your, mo on your money is a thing again. And I think for me, it gives people disposable income. So before they may have been quite strict with their spending, and all of a sudden, if you've got 100000 and you're getting an extra $5,000 a year at 5%, whatever the numbers are, yep. and it's $400 a month, you're going to spend a little bit more than what you have done. And at the same time, that may be counteracting the, the market in terms of a recession because mm -hmm. you've got all of these savers now getting a return. Correct. Who are probably going to be spending a little bit. Hey, let's go away for the weekend or let's go out for dinner. Correct. I mean, it's kind of Correct. like... I, I now have a third income. 
Correct. Right. In a dual household income, you've got a third income now, which is your money working for you. So that that definitely um, helps to um, keep individuals' households uh, much much more much more balanced. If we look from an international perspective, when I read when I'm in London, you know the job the new jobs that are being created are still all time highs. Yep. It tends to be full full employment. Mm -hmm. How are you seeing the economy locally here in Miami and Florida? Yeah, yeah I think that you know like most most places, um, economies are, are very regional, right? So you say you know the dynamics that are playing out in South Florida and Miami. Um, there's a lot of people that are coming here from the Northeast, from California, from other, you know, high state income tax locations. They're gravitating towards Miami. Um, what has happened in Miami is that Miami wasn't prepared for this massive influx of people. And what that has meant to the local economy is that salaries have increased. The cost of housing has gone up as well. The ability for people to find and rent at attractive levels uh, has become more challenging. Um, and I think the biggest thing is schools. Where we don't have enough schools for all of the individuals that are coming here. You have many more individuals that have kids that can afford private school than there are availability of, of private school. So you are starting to see some of that play out uh, that is limiting the growth. Now, hopefully there are groups that are out there that are thinking about these bigger uh, issues. Um, but these are things that are going to be considerations for people and who actually moves to South Florida. If you're an individual from Europe and you want to buy real estate and you don't have a family, that's not that big of a concern for you. But if you're someone from the Northeast and you have a few kids, it is a very serious consideration for you. Um, and that will have an impact on certain pockets in certain areas, um, which is why my advice for a lot of individuals is to find out where you want to be. And then when some of these corrections and some of these adjustments happen in the market, you know exactly what's available and you have an opportunity to make an offer. Because I do think um, that real estate is not a all U.S. asset class, right? You can find attractive opportunities in all markets. It's just a function of knowing exactly what you're trying to optimize for. So the most important thing I'd imagine is be prepared. And what do you need to do to be prepared to take advantage of any opportunities that come along? I think you need to spend time here. You need to spend time in the markets. You need to understand what makes the home or the property that you're buying not just desirable for yourself, but what would make it desirable for someone else. Because ultimately, you're going to buy something and at some point you're going to want to sell it. And we all like to sell things for more than what we paid for that. Sure. But if there is no next incremental buyer, there's no, there's no appreciation to the property. And I think that that's where we've gotten right now is that no one is really that excited to buy right now. Rates are high. Property values have increased quite a bit. So if there's no next incremental buyer, then now you have to discount until you do find that appropriate buyer. And that's where I think that international clients that are coming here that they already know what they want ahead of time, they can be prepared. They can know what the value is of what they want to pay. And there will be an opportunity where they may be able to bid something 10, 20% lower than what someone is willing to ask for the property. Or maybe there is someone, if you have local contacts with good realtors, with people that are in the local area that know of an off-market deal because they know someone that bought something or they happen to be moving it's not going to get listed and you have an opportunity to, to take advantage of that inside information. That's incredible. So yes, we're going to see some sort of correction, not a crash, which is fantastic news. And yes, there will be buying opportunities for those that are prepared to spend the time, invest, talk to the right professional advisors and get ahead of the game. And for me, with most assets, it's when do you buy and sell? And most of the money normally is made from buying well. Yep. Buying. Absolutely. Yeah, you're never going to find yeah. the perfect high yeah. or the perfect low. But if, like you say, if you do your research mm -hmm. and you buy well, whether there's someone's getting divorced and they want a quick sale, yeah. someone's got promoted and they move, they need to move to a different yeah. part of the country, yeah. and into an international buyer wants to come and live in Florida, so they move. Yep. Yeah. And I think those buyers. I mean, where's a good place for international people to buy? I mean, there's so much choice here. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of locations, right? If you want to be close to the ocean, right? If you're in Latin America, Miami is the closest thing to home with the safety and security where you can enjoy your life and, and, and really um, have great food, have good restaurants, right? Really be able to live your life. Um, Miami is a great place to be able to do it's that. It's so vibrant. I mean, so from an international perspective, we've got David Beckham um, having bought here um, in sort of, I would describe it probably Midtown Miami. Yeah, that's downtown Miami across from the Miami Arena. So, yeah, yeah so, so, warm in there. so he's here. Lionel Messi, I mean, a global superstar. I don't know what the impact he's having no, locally. It's been, it's, been, it's been massive, right? I think that it will change the trajectory of soccer or football 
in this country. It, it will make it a sport that kids want to play. I have a young son and he runs around the house kicking the ball now. He never <laughs> would have done that. He says he's messy. So wow. to me, that's, yeah. that's transformational, right? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, that, you know, I have a little boy too, and it's kind of like what they see, they follow and play and get passionate about. So traditionally speaking, the U.S., would that be American football? Would it be baseball? Would it be basketball? Because there's so many sports which kind of don't really happen. Out, they do happen elsewhere in the world, but yeah. they're not as big. I mean, yeah. basketball is massive here, yeah. but not really anywhere else in the world. Baseball's the same. Yeah. So what do kids I think it depends Dude. where you are in the country, right? Okay. So, if you're, so, for example, if you're in South Florida, the biggest thing here is is basketball because of the Miami Heat, right? They've had a lot of success as a franchise. Okay. In baseball. We've got some of that, but not as consistent. If you're in other places, perhaps more rural America, football tends to be, you know, American football tends to be okay. uh, more, more, more followed. And then you've got baseball in different, in different pockets. Um, I, w I think that those are the three main sports yeah. uh, that, are, that are out there because that's what kids will play in school. And then soccer comes along, you've got Messi and other people that... Which is now starting to pop up as this alternative. Um, and I think what's, a, what's, what's been attractive to, about soccer in, in, in this country in particular is that there's a lot of fields. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of American uh, football fields that are now being repurposed to actually incorporate soccer. Soccer is another one of those sports where there's college scholarships. So there's a path where if the parents are investing in the kid's future and taking them to practice and taking them to tournaments, that hopefully there will be some return on that investment where other sports like American football and basketball, it may be more challenging. So that's starting to develop. And I think that we will start to see, and there will be this defining moment in, uh, in, in, in soccer and football here in the U.S. as the uh, pre messi era and, and the post yeah. era, and, and it will, and I will mean, change it. You can see it from social media. And also the amount of people that are now watching and are looking at Miami or probably visiting Miami. I mean, I have to say, one of the first things I did when I landed was, is there a game? Am I going to be able to see a game while I'm here? Yeah. I have never, ever in my whole life come to America and thought about, hey, I'm going to go watch a football game. Yeah. You, know, I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking, okay, is Messi playing? Am I going to get to see him? I was very lucky. I saw him play with PSG against Man City two years ago in the Champions League. And it was incredible just to watch him play. Uh, and to have that kind of opportunity in America must be kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had the good fortune of going to several games, and uh, it's electric. I mean, there's there's no other way of describing it. You know, the ball gets anywhere close to him, and, and the stadium <laughs> erupts, and you can feel the energy, and you can feel the excitement. Fantastic. And uh, it, it, there's just a, there's a buzz ar around it, right? There's an yeah. excitement around it. it it's, it's, it's changed everything, I think. And I think the, for a location like South Florida, and, you know, not just Miami, but Fort Lauderdale and this, it has uh, given one more reason for people to want to travel here. You know, the thought of a fan in Latin America and Argentina to be able to jump on a plane, True. come here, stay in a hotel, watch Messi, have some good food and go back. They're going to now see Miami as a place to aspire to potentially live to or invest in or to be part of. So I don't think it's just going to be uh, an impact around football and soccer. I think it's going to be a bigger impact for Miami as a city and as a gateway to the US uh, that people will now have exposure to. Messi will be the excuse for that, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think that we'll see a lot of uh, additional foreign investment that'll come because of this. I think that's very true. I hadn't thought about that. So if you're Argentinian and you love Messi and you've not been able to afford to travel to Europe to watch it now, uh, you know, I don't know how expensive a flight would be from Argentina to go. There's many uh, direct flights. Yeah. You can jump on a direct flight, an overnight flight. You're here, you can go to a game, you can watch him. Amazing. And you can have oh, a good few days and, 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 and then zip up to Disney. Yeah. And then come back and, and fly back home and, and, and have it be on, on the same time zone instead of having to jet uh, from Argentina to Miami, Miami to Europe, and, 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 and vice versa, right? That, 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 that's no longer a, a couple day trip. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, a yeah. week. So. That's amazing. Incredible. It's amazing when you travel the world and talk to interesting people and learn so many different things about the vibe, what's happening, and, and the opportunities that. Because Messi's come, now it's opened a gateway for lots of football lovers mm -hmm. in that part of the country to yep. come and visit. Yep. So with property, I read something recently where your advice for opportunities to buy could be new home developments. What yep. sort of things? Yep. I know the terminology is different here in America. So where do you think those opportunities may be? And what sort of incentives are you seeing yep. in this part of the world? Yeah, so you know, in the US, we have 
existing inventory that gets sold. Uh, and then we have very large home builders here that develop communities, uh, which is newer construction or brand new construction. Um, so those are the two sure. distinct markets. Um, I think if you look at the secondary existing home inventory, there's not a lot of it out there, right? We've, we've defined, right, that the desirability to sell right now with low rates is not really there. But if you look at the new construction, right, with these home builders, they're highly incentivized because their whole business revolves around selling thousands of homes every single year. If you look at the U.S., we have a shortage of homes, of people that want to buy homes, millennials and other um, uh, pockets of, of demographics that need to and want to buy homes. Um, so what that has meant is that there's a shortage of homes, but these home builders still want to sell a lot of these homes. And what that has meant is that as rates have gone up, they've had to get creative around how do they sell these homes oh, when really? rates are high so that people can afford them. So what they have done is that they've created these incentives to basically buy down the interest rate to get it to levels that are much more attractive. So that's a really interesting point. So buying down the interest rate, I've not heard of that before. I've heard of incentives where builders, as we call them in the UK, construction companies here would maybe give you 10% to buy the property. So you're saying buying down the rate. So Correct. for example, if an average rate, call it eight, the builder is saying, okay, we're going to make your rate 5%. Correct. So they're going to contribute seller credits from their yeah. side incentives yeah. yeah so that that can be used with a mortgage lender or a lender some like with yeah. us for example yeah and because they are basically giving us dollars to buy down that rate we can give that customer an interest rate that is no longer eight could be seven could be six we've got rates right now that are as low as five percent in this market where the world is eight percent because the seller in this case a home builder is trying to incentivize someone to buy this home and not be constrained by the fact that rates are high. And in the future, when rates do come down, they can refinance at a lower rate, hopefully, um, but allowing that customer to not have to wait to buy that home, which is a, which is a big a, a big issue. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? I mean, eight down to say five oh, or six. Oh, it's massive. That makes all the difference it's to massive. someone buying. It brings affordability. Correct makes it possible now for people to buy homes. And what they're doing is that they're not just buying the rate, they're contributing to closing costs. So, okay, closing costs, educate the world. Yeah. So what is yeah. that? Yeah, so closing costs consist of uh, paying uh, to record the transaction in the county. It consists of paying for appraisals. It consists for uh, paying for certain taxes and, and different aspects in the closing of the transaction. Okay. So they are contributing Again, so like an incentive, so, so they're contributing to save the costs, like say $5,000, yeah. they may say, okay, if you buy this property and complete by this yeah. date, we'll give you an extra $2,000 towards so it's that. Even, so it's even more than that. So wow. generally the closing cost in a real estate transaction could be anywhere from, you know, 3% to 6%, depending on Huge. the type of transaction. So what they're saying is that we will not only buy your rate, but we will also contribute some money to your closing cost. So what that effectively means is that this individual buying this home, which is brand new, by the way, no one's yeah. ever lived in it, yeah. you are getting dollars that are being contributed. So the cost for you to buy that home is less. So if you look at the contrast to the secondary market, where now you're having to compete with multiple people to buy that home because there's not enough inventory at a higher interest rate, here you have a contrast with this new home. You get a brand new home. It's perfect. It has warranty. It's in a great up and coming community. You're getting your closing costs paid for. They're buying down the rate for you. So there's a massive incentive. And those numbers could be anywhere from five to 15%, depending on the home and the community and the incentives that the builder wants to provide. But wow. those, are, those are big discounts. That's a huge, that I mean, that's that an there. amazing opportunity to hear about. So if you're looking to buy a new home, there are incentives as much as five to 15% to make your dream home a reality, which is incredible. And that allows people to make that first step for a home mover mm -hmm. to, to, to buy. Or start to buy properties. And you know, sometimes when individuals are making investments, you can choose to buy a home that might be $2 million, or you can go and buy four homes that are $500,000. Uh, and then you're able to basically get a loan through, through Milo. We can provide this incentive through our relationships with these home builders. And this individual can buy a brand new home instead of perhaps some individuals deciding to buy some homes that are in the secondary market, that are at the attractive price point, 
but it's probably because they have some issues with them or you're buying a home that's 80, 90 years old where now you have to actually invest in it where now you're buying a brand new home, you can list it, you can rent it out, it's desirable. And because it's in an up and coming community will likely appreciate, it's more attractive today. And that's what I mean by there's always opportunities in different markets. You just need to understand where are they? And if you keep looking just in secondary, what's existing out there, you might miss out on this brand new home construction opportunity because of where we are in the market too. And do so, those incentives apply to foreign nationals? So if I was to say, okay, I want to buy a home here, do I get those same incentives or it's, not? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. So these incentives historically have only been for U.S. Okay. Buys. So we're the first company that's actually been able to do this for foreign nationals um, because we saw the value of how this was helping U.S. clients. Yeah. We wanted to bring it to international clients as well because international clients have historically benefited when there have been corrections in the market because they are more attract uh, they are more attracted to the U.S. market when there's value to invest. So we're now seeing that there is enough value today where you can capture some of these incentives and these credits to be able to buy a home today. You don't need to wait. You just need to find the right properties. So the advice here is to make sure you do your research, understand new build developments, construction homes, communities that are being built where there are incentives for you to acquire. And I think doing the research, get prepared, get pre-approved for the credit, and then get ready to go when you want to buy. Yes. Credible. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very interesting market right now because there are these pockets of opportunities because the aspect of rates being at all-time lows and all-time highs have distorted certain things in the market. If we had normalized rates, we wouldn't need these incentives by these home builders because people could get low mortgage rates. You might be seeing a different type of incentive to promote uh, home ownership, or they wouldn't need to because there's a shortage of homes, like I described, which is why they've ramped up construction over the last couple of years. This opportunity wouldn't exist. So in a way, the dynamic of this rapid rate rise is what's presented this opportunity. And I think that that's where you can benefit and, and leverage some of it. Right place at right time. And so thank you for that. So with these incentives and paying down the rate, how long does those, do those incentives last? Two years, three years? for one year, because that's kind of important. So if I'm yeah. coming to buy and rates are high in the marketplace, but I get a, a construction incentive to pay down the rate, how long do those incentives last yeah. on rates? Yeah so, yeah, so those incentives tend to be for two years. Okay. So, so, so that year subsidized years. rate that normally the rate would be eight or 9%, yeah. we can get it down to 5% and that lasts for two years. Okay. Now, fortunately with Milo, because we do lots of other mortgages and we work with international clients, we have the opportunity to refinance them out into a 30-year rate. What we believe is that rates will come down, which will make it more attractive within the next 24 months, and then we'll be able to refi them at a lower rate at that point in time. So again, it's being prepared and timing is everything. Yep. Being able to take advantage of that incentive today, because that incentive won't be around always, being able to utilize the opportunity to invest today, and then later on, refinance at a, at a lower rate if you plan to keep that property for a longer period of time. Amazing. Thank you very much. So that's an amazing opportunity to look at. What else are you seeing, Justin, from your experience right now in the market? And what, what else could I be looking at or should be looking at? Yeah. yeah so, so we've had the, the opportunity to work with over 13,000 clients from all over the world wanting to invest in the U.S. from 90 countries. So we see, we see a lot and we lend all across the U.S. One of the things that we saw over the last couple of years was this rapid rise of people buying homes to Airbnb them. And I think this was a general theme coming out of COVID that individuals were buying homes and then renting them out and seeing that they could make quite a bit of rental income, not renting it out for 12 months, but renting it out night by night. Yeah. And what we're starting to see already is that there's certain pockets and concentrations all across the US of inventory that is starting to come online because the cost of taxes and insurance has increased. And now people are not traveling as much to an and Airbnb being um, that the return is coming down. So more homes are being listed. And I think that that's one theme that I'm, I'm watching very closely is how does this impact certain communities? And will you get some distress in those markets if many people find that they can't make a return because there are certain communities across the US in places like Arizona and other states where so much of the transaction volume was to Airbnb. It'll be everyone could Airbnb and we may flip to 
not many people will profitably be able to do Airbnb, which means people will be forced to sell. And that could also be an attractive opportunity where if you know the value of a particular area, you might be able to capture a good deal on the secondary market. That's fantastic. Thank you so, so much to Joseph for sharing with his insights, his knowledge, Airbnb, Messi, the impacts of builder incentives. Even though there may be some sort of correction, we're not getting a crash, which is great news. And with adjustments, there's always going to be opportunities. So do your research, prepare well. And thank you so much, Joseph. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you and interview again today. And, and for all those of you that don't, please remember to like and subscribe. And if you want to reach out to Milo, the details will be in the comments below. Thank you so much.